in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins and in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. Through the example of Christ, we can see several things about the suffering that we encounter. Number one, Jesus, when he encountered suffering and opposition in his ministry, he committed no sin, verse 22. But you continue to look and it says not only did he not sin, he committed no lies. And honestly, the easiest thing to do when you find yourself in a situation like this is to lie. Because it it helps us get out of those earthly circumstances that we find ourselves in. But he did not lie when he was faced with these trials and this suffering. Verse 23, he repaid evil with good. This is backwards. In our, in our uh, culture today, people, when, when they do something bad to you, you want to have an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. People, they take that verse all the time from Scripture and say, the Bible says we can take revenge. Actually, God says vengeance is mine. And Jesus repaid evil with good. The people that slapped him and spit him and placed a crown of thorns on his head, he died for them too. He repaid evil with good. Verse 23, he trusted in God. And verse 24, he thought of other people, specifically you and me. The next time we suffer, remember how Christ carried himself when he was persecuted. As he hung on the cross, Christ thought about you and about me, not about his earthly circumstances. So remember Christ when we're suffering. It could be that you're here tonight and you have the opportunity now to respond to the sacrifice of Christ. And you can have the blood of Jesus wash away the sins that have tainted our relationship with Him. And so if you're here this evening and you need to respond, please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Interesting class, one that I have spent several weeks studying for. 
I was going to do this class a couple weeks ago, but someone sent me a couple of links that I had to check out and I wanted to dig into a little bit more. So I spent some more time studying this topic. And before we get into it, I was sitting down in my pew and I noticed that I put prine right here instead of prince. That's a little better. We're talking about Melchizedek and his relation to Jesus. Several things we're going to look at tonight that are very interesting have to do with who Melchizedek is, but also how he is used in the Old Testament and the foreshadowing of Christ to come. Before we get into uh, our class this evening, I want to ask what y'all know about Melchizedek. What do y'all know about Melchizedek? Abraham paid tithes to him. We're going to look at that section of Scripture here very shortly. Is that what you were going to say? Okay. First time he is mentioned, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 14, uh, and where Abraham, who was looked at in uh, very high esteem by the Jewish people since he was basically the uh, father of all Jewish people, uh, he paid tithes to Melchizedek in Genesis 14, uh, which we will look at Hebrews chapter 7 and see why that's so important later on tonight. Um, what else? What else do we know about Melchizedek? Okay, he's a priest. He is a, a priest. We find that in uh, Psalm 110. We're going to look at that this evening, but there's probably a reason why we don't know too much about Melchizedek as a whole, and that's because he's only mentioned in three books of the Bible and pretty brief. So we don't really get a, a big description about who Melchizedek is, which is where the speculation and, and people start to try and guess who Melchizedek is because it is kind of mysterious surrounding this man and the way that he is described. But tonight we're going to be talking about this very interesting man and his relation to Christ. He has been the source of a lot of confusion for many years, and I'll tell you, it goes back pretty far for me because my older brother, we went to this thing called Future Preachers Training Camp in Colorado. And uh, this was back in 2008 or 9. That's way back for me, not for a lot of people, but 2008 or 9, way back in the good old days. Um, my brother got this topic, and it was Melchizedek and Jesus. And I remember that that topic that he gave, we studied it together, and I was only like 10 or 11 at the time. And he was trying to, to piece these things together, and I could just, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't understand the, the correlation between Jesus and Melchizedek, and that's what we're going to spend a lot of time on tonight. I do know that there's a lot of questions on who he is, uh, but I do want to spend a good majority of time, that's why I wrote this on the board, looking at Christ and Melchizedek, because that is why he's mentioned in Scripture. We first, about, we first read about Melchizedek in Genesis 14. If you would, go ahead and open up there. Genesis chapter 14. It was in my brain. Um, I can, uh, I'll type it up. How about that? Because you have to have a translator for the whiteboard. So uh, let me, let me type it up. In fact, I learned a lot of this in class and we got a chart. Uh, it's not, doesn't have as many on there, but it is the, basically the, the summary of both. I can send that to you. Uh, but yes, send it to you too. Okay. Tell me afterwards and uh, three. All right. We'll, we'll start counting after class here. <laughs> We'll do a mass email. There we go. I'll have Terry. Okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing that then. Uh, we first read about Melchizedek in Genesis 14, but in order to understand who he is, we need to start by looking at Abraham. Uh, as several of you have already mentioned this evening, uh, there is a very interesting account that happens with Abraham in Melchizedek in Genesis 14. Before we get to Genesis 14, however, someone tell me. What was Abraham, or rather Abram at the time, told to do by God? The very beginning. What did God tell him to do? Leave his home, Leave his home and go into the land of Canaan, a land that he was going to promise to him. So he says to leave everything that he'd ever known, travel to a land that God would show him, and then through this decision, what was God going to do with Abraham? Bless him. In what way? 
Okay, as many descendants as there are stars in the heaven. The father of many uh, descendants would come after him, the father of nations. And not only that, whoever blessed him, he would bless. And whoever would curse Abraham, God would curse. And so he's given this basically decision by God. Leave which everything that you know, everything that you're comfortable with, the place that you grew up, or travel to this unknown land and I will bless you beyond your wildest dreams. And so Abraham... As we see in Hebrews chapter 11, through faith, he decided to trust in God, and he did make him a great nation later on. But at 75 years old, Abraham and his wife and his nephew Lot and all of their animals and all of their servants, they pick up from where he was staying in um, uh, Haram, and then he left for Shechem in Canaan. And so they move there to Shechem and Lot, his nephew, and Abraham. They begin to grow and grow and grow until finally Abraham and Lot, they have to make a decision. They can't keep living together. They have too much stuff. Never had that problem. But they had way too many animals, way too many servants. And so Abraham and Lot say, you know, it's best if we split up because we need room for all of our belongings. And so Lot, he decides to leave. And where does he go? Sodom, and that's where he makes a mistake. He chooses to go near the city of Sodom. And that's where we pick up in Genesis chapter 14, because not long after Lot makes this decision to move near Sodom, he gets caught in between a battle of kings. And so here's Lot. He makes this decision to go into Sodom. He makes a bad call, and then him and his family are taken into captivity. Look at Genesis chapter 14. And someone read verse 9. There's a couple of hard words in there. Against Chenelo Lamar, king of Elam, Idol, king of nations, Amphrapel, king of Shinar, Abrah, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Okay, so we've got a pretty big battle going on. We have these powerful men who have their own kingdoms and they come together. There's four kings against five kings. And as they're fighting over this, we skip down to verse 12. And what does it say? They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So these kings, they defeat uh, the, the other nations. And then in their spoils of Sodom, the city, they decide to go ahead and take Lot's nephew and all of his possessions as well. Too. And so what happens next is where we begin to find this account of Abraham or Abram and Melchizedek. Someone read verse 14. Genesis 14, 14. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Okay, so first of all, Abram had quite a, uh, a big household, uh, 318 men who were eligible to fight uh, that grew up in Abraham's household. They went against these kings. Skipping down to verse 16, uh, it says, So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. So Abram took 318 men. He tracked down these kings of Canaan. He destroys them. He takes back Lot, his nephew, and all of their possessions and all of their goods. And it is here that we are introduced to Melchizedek, king of Salem. Someone read verses 18 through 20. Okay, there's a commentary in the book of Hebrews on this section of Scripture. We're going to get there in a moment, but before that, I want to look at Melchizedek and his name and where he is king. So you'll notice, first of all, that Melchizedek's name actually means king of righteousness. And then it says that he's a king of where? Salem. Does that sound familiar? Salem? 
Oregon. I was thinking Oregon, but okay. Jeru Salem. You have the city of, does anyone know what Salem means? Peace. So we have Melchizedek, whose name means king of righteousness, who is the king of Salem, that is king of peace. Very interesting description given to Melchizedek here, and it gets even crazier. If you keep reading on, we find out that that Abram gives a tithe, as y'all mentioned, to Melchizedek. In Hebrews chapter 7, we're going to get there in just a moment. Hebrews chapter 7, I saw you trying to flip there. Hebrews chapter 7, it tells us basically that the lesser gives ties to the greater. That is, you recognize a position of authority here. Abram, being the father of nations, being this man that has a ton of wealth, gives a tithe to Melchizedek. What does that mean about Melchizedek? Greater than Abraham. And that's the point that is played on in Hebrews chapter 7. But what's also unusual about Melchizedek is that he is described as being both a king and what? A priest. This was pretty unusual to have a king and a priest. Someone tell me, what does a king do? What does a king do? Leads in battle, okay? Watches over the people, makes decisions for his uh, nation. A king is in control and is over the people. Someone tell me, what does a priest do? The priests were in charge of bridging the gap between God and man, the spiritual lives of people. And so you have here in Melchizedek both a king and a priest. For this to happen was unheard of, and for several reasons. Number one, this was before the time of the Levitical priesthood. Uh, someone tell me, what is the Levitical priesthood? Okay, through the line of Aaron, you had a group of men that were eligible, if they were from that tribe of Levi, to be a priest. And if you were from the tribe of Levi, you could then bridge that gap between God and man. However, Melchizedek is around 400 years before the line of Aaron or the Levitical priesthood was even established. So who made him a priest? Okay, God made him a priest. He couldn't have been born into the tribe of Levi because standing in front of him, Abram, he had Israel's seed within him not even born yet. And so it wasn't from his family or his genealogy that placed him as a high priest. And we'll see in just a moment how he was put over this position of both king and priest. No Jew in the Old Testament ever served the office of both king and priest. And this is very important for us to understand. Melchizedek is described as being both. Go ahead. We're going to go to Second Chronicles in just a moment because there is an example of that that proves even further just how unusual this is, and especially for God to acknowledge it and not do something about it. Yep. Sorry. Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. I'll tell you what, there can be no secrets in this class. I need to start covering up the board. <laughs> Although you can't read it anyway, so it's not really that dangerous. Uh, but that is true, and we are going to get there as well. There's a lot of similarities, and there's a reason we put that up on the board. Abraham, however, recognized Melchizedek as a priest, and with the spoils that Abram won in battle of getting Lot back, he gave a tenth to Melchizedek. He tithed to Melchizedek because he was a high priest of the Great God, as we see in verse 18, priest of God most high. So why is this a big deal? Well, tithing was established under the, the rule and reign of the Levitical priesthood. And so it's interesting that Abram looked at Melchizedek and saw him as someone worthy of tithing. And if let's go ahead and flip over to Hebrews chapter 7. Let me get someone to read Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 4.
There was no command to give a tenth here for Abram. He was not under the Mosaic Law because the Mosaic Law did not exist at this point. And so Abram, choosing to do this, notice Hebrews chapter 7, verse 4. It says, Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of his spoils. Again, this is talking about Melchizedek. Melchizedek wasn't a priest of Israel. Israel did not exist at this point. And so, this is making him a very unique priest and king. Now, let's go ahead and look at at Hebrews, or Genesis chapter 14, very quickly, in verse 18. You mentioned uh, the bread and wine that was offered. And if you'll notice in Genesis chapter 14, in verse 18, it says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. What does bread and wine remind you of? The Lord's Supper. So there's another connection between Melchizedek and Jesus. In fact, if you look over in Luke 22, you'll see just where uh, Jesus instituted this with His uh, apostles. I believe it is Luke 22. I didn't write down the reference. I think it is Luke 22? Okay, Luke 22. Four. There it is. I knew, I figured I wrote it down somewhere. Luke 22, 17 and 19. He offered bread and wine to the apostles. So, someone tell me, why did Melchizedek offer bread and wine to Abram? And why did God, or Jesus, and incarnate, offer bread and wine to the apostles? What's the connection there? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 7 again. I'm going to take a moment here and I'm going to read Hebrews Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 1. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who received the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abram. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. A lot of interesting things revealed here in Hebrews chapter 7, and we're going to continue reading on here, but I want to pause for a moment and look at verse 3. Who is verse 3 describing? Without father, without mother, without genealogy. Who does that sound like? Jesus is described, if we continue to look on, if we go to other places, uh, as you will see on the board, the eternal Word of God, John 1 verses 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word that is Christ dwelt with God, meaning He had no created beginning. And not only that, when Jesus was sacrificed on the cross, placed in the tomb, and raised from the dead, where did He go? Into heaven. At the right hand of God. Did Jesus die and stay dead? So does that mean if He was in the beginning with God and He did not die when He was killed but came out of the grave and went to heaven, does that mean that He had an end? No. Jesus, without beginning and without end. But what is interesting is the fact that Melchizedek is described as having no mother and no father. We can say that Jesus pre-incarnate would not have had a mother or a father. But what happened when Jesus came to this earth? Did He have a mother? He was 100% man. He had to come from a physical human, a female. And so, Jesus 
in the flesh came through Mary. This is, this is something that I really want to focus on, especially looking at verse 11 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11 says, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? So the Hebrew writer here is making a point. He's saying if the Aaronic priesthood forgave sins, there would have been no need for Christ to come in the likeness of Melchizedek. What does it mean that Christ came in the likeness of Melchizedek? He is a priest forever, but he's also not from the tribe of Aaron or from Levi. And so, since he is not a descendant of Aaron, he's a descendant from the line of Judah, he was placed in that position as great high priest forever by who? God. Let's look at Psalm 110 and verse 4. Psalm 110 and verse 4. David, in this this psalm, it is uh, basically a prophecy of the Messiah to come. Psalm 110, someone read verse 4. Okay, in Genesis chapter 14, just connecting the dots so far, we learn that Melchizedek's identity places him in a position of both priest and king of Salem, king of peace. And then in Psalm 110 and verse 4, it connects Melchizedek to who? The Messiah. And so from Psalm 110, we can go to Hebrews chapter 5 through 7, where it describes Jesus' supremacy as great high priest. So in the same way that Melchizedek had no father and no mother, had no genealogy, basically no trace of where Melchizedek came from, he didn't come from the line of Aaron or from the Levitical priesthood. Instead, he was placed in a position of high priest, Genesis 14, for the Most High God by God Himself. So who does that make Melchizedek? We're going to get there in just a moment. But look at all the similarities between Melchizedek and Christ. You look at Melchizedek. He is known as a king of righteousness. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 2. We look in the Old Testament, especially Psalm 110 and verse 4, we learn that the anointed king, that is the Messiah, is going to come and rule the nations, but not in the sense that the Jews thought. It was different than the physical Levitical priesthood that came. We also notice that Melchizedek is described as the king of peace. If you write like me, you'll see that Jesus is the prime, but I meant prince of peace. There's a lot of similarities and descriptions. You keep going. Priest of the Most High God, as we read. High priest for all of eternity. Hebrews chapter 6. Let's flip there. Hebrews chapter 6. Any questions or comments so far? If you're confused, nod your head. Hebrews chapter 6. Let me get someone to read verses 20 and someone else to read chapter 8 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 20 and chapter 8 and verse 1. Jesus has gone as forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of... All right. Chapter 8 and verse 1. Okay, so for a minute here, I want to pause. A lot of times people get caught into this trying to figure out who Melchizedek is. Let me just make a point here. Hebrews chapter 5, 6, and 7, as we see in the start of chapter 8, he says the main point, the reason we're talking about Melchizedek in the first place and comparing him to Jesus, the main point of this is to say that we have such a high priest sitting at the right hand of God, not from the tribe of Levi, because that did not forgive sins. Hebrews chapter 7. Instead, we have a divinely anointed great high priest who had no beginning and no end because he was there with God in the beginning, and then he did not die when he was killed. And he has no genealogy, meaning you cannot trace this priest through the tribe of Levi. Continuing on, both were king and priest, something extremely rare. In fact, these are the only two that are in your Bible that are both priest and king according to God's wishes. Let's go over to Second Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. 
If you're wondering where 2 Chronicles is, it's after 1 Chronicles. Uh, 2 Chronicles 26, and notice verse 16. It says, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him were eight priests of the Lord, valiant men, and they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. Then Isaiah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and while he was angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar, and Azariah the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous, so they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. What happens when a king tries to do the job of a priest? God strikes you with leprosy. We we see that here. What happened if a priest would try to do the role of a king? They couldn't do it because the priests were supposed to only do that one job, and that is be the bridge between God and man. Yes. Well, I I just I was just thinking about how we were talking about the roles earlier. How the king is the one that goes out and fights the boards and kind of rallies the people and keeps them in line. And, you know, he gets his hands dirty. But the priest is that bridge. He can't have dirty hands. You know, he can't be going out and killing people and, mm-hmm. you know, ruling with an iron fist. He's got to, uh, you know, he's got to be above that. Yep. But, but when, you know, the king or, you know, anyone tries to do a priestly duty, Saul uh, made sacrifice. He couldn't wait around for, you know. <laughs> Samuel. Yeah, couldn't wait for Samuel to, to get there. So, well, I'm going to go ahead and do this sacrifice. And I'm going to in trouble for that. Mm-hmm. God said, you're not going to be king anymore. Um, so, I mean, it just, you can't mix the two. Mm-mm. And that's, I'm glad you brought up that point because if you look at what David wanted to do, even outside of uh, making sacrifice for people, all he wanted to do was build the temple. David wanted to build the temple, and God said, You have too much blood on your hands. You fought too much. You've done the role of a king as you're supposed to, but those aren't the kind of people you can still be right with God, but not be what he's looking for for that specific situation. In fact, uh, and if you look in the book of Leviticus, there's rule after rule after rule of cleanliness and how only certain men can be a part of this because God wants a whole and perfect connection between him and the people. Most of their time purifying themselves. <laughs> they had a hard job. They did. Uh, but I'm glad you brought that point up because uh, it, was a, it was a separate thing. You were either a priest or a king, not both. But we continue on. Uh, not only are both of them king and priest, there is no genealogy. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3 tells us that Melchizedek has no traceable genealogy. The people had no idea who his father and mother were or where he came into the picture at. They had no idea. And then we see that Jesus, or rather God, was at the beginning with the word and he had no beginning or end. Not of the seed of Aaron. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 6, basically Melchizedek did not come from that Levitical priesthood. Neither did Jesus. He was from the tribe of Judah. Let's look over at Hebrews chapter 7 again. Any questions or comments so far? Hebrews chapter 7. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself, how did they get in that position of high priest? Uh, And the only way that we could say that Melchizedek was a priest for the Most High God was because God appointed him in that position. And the same with Christ. Even though he was not from the tribe of Levi, he is still the perfect great high priest being like Melchizedek in many ways, which we're going to get to in just a moment if we have uh, enough time. Hebrews chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 12, it says, The priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another trot, from which no man has officiated at the altar. Who's he talking about? Who's verse 12 talking about? 
Look at the next verse. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. This is extremely important because everyone that wanted to be a priest had to be from the tribe of Levi, but the Hebrew writer is saying this great high priest is like Melchizedek in verse 13. And just like Melchizedek in verse 13, verse 14 shows us that Jesus was from the line of Judah, something that Moses didn't even speak anything about. And so we again are seeing this process of comparing Jesus to Melchizedek. Verse 15 says, And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, this is going to sound familiar, Psalm 110 and verse 4, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. What does it mean according to the order? In a like manner. Uh, there are other translations that will say similarly or in the same way. Now this is important. Uh, it just seems like you're kind of splitting hairs here, but if you look at the way that it is phrased, he doesn't say you are a priest just like Melchizedek. He says similarly to Melchizedek. Now, what does that mean? Well, this is opinion. Um, do with it as you will. I do believe that the Messiah that is spoken about in Hebrews chapter 7, especially in verse in chapter 8, after this summary of Melchizedek, is Melchizedek. Now, I'll tell you how I got to that point. There's no other king and priest. There is no other... And when it says no genealogy, it's not saying he can't be found in books. It's saying he doesn't have one. Who does that sound like? Well, we continue on. Not of the seed of Aaron, meaning he didn't have to come from the tribe of Levi, but was still priest of the Most High God. Abraham, the father of every nation, looked at Melchizedek and gave him a tenth. And then not only that, Melchizedek blessed Abram. And so there's this obvious distinction between Abraham, the father of the nations, and Melchizedek, a high priest for the Most High God who had no beginning, no end, and no genealogy. Not of the seed of Aaron, greater than Levitical priest, based on the words of an oath. Going back to Psalm 110.4, it says, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, meaning that Melchizedek, in the same likeness as Jesus, has an eternal priesthood. He doesn't say that Melchizedek ever quit being a priest. In fact, Psalm 110.4 says, Melchizedek, just like Jesus, or Melchizedek and Jesus, have that high priesthood position Forever. Any questions or comments so far? We're going to continue going into this. Melchizedek. Yep. Well, and, and that's really, and people, people, what they will do is they will say either Melchizedek is Jesus or they'll say that Melchizedek is a man that we have no records of and we don't know where he was born and where he died. Uh, and so, in the same likeness as Melchizedek was like this, Jesus on a whole nother level was similar. Um, that phrase that I have a hard time with is in. Uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 7, when it says, in the likeness of, is basically saying these two had a very similar existence, have a very similar existence. And not only that, uh, when you look at how the uh, recorded writers David speaks of Melchizedek and Abraham treated Melchizedek, but also the promises given to Melchizedek being an eternal priest, 
it's kind of hard to, to say that they are two different people and rather they should be the same. You had something? Mm -hmm. like the Son of God. Yep. You know, Jesus has made various appearances all through Scripture. I mean, he's, he's been on the scene from the very beginning. And, it, you know, it helps us understand more if we can build that foundation and believe that that's going to help our faith and our belief. Jesus has always been. He had to come in the flesh because he was the, the Lamb of God. He had to, to live a human life and sacrifice that mm -hmm. blood. Well, and not only that, when you look at his uh, interceding for us, he is still pleading to God, and in my opinion, in a, a fleshly form because he has to relate to us still, and he still is advocating, knowing what that feels like to be uh, what we experience and who we are. But not only that, what you said uh, is what we're going to look at here in Hebrews chapter 7, continuing on. Uh, and what's really great about this uh, question is if you keep reading, uh, it just gets clearer and clearer, uh, especially in chapter 7. It says, verse 18, For on the one hand there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, that is, the Levitical priesthood. Verse 19 says, For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord is sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the other people. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Again, going back to the point of this text, the reason Melchizedek is brought up in the first place, the reason we have Genesis 14 and Psalm 110 and these three chapters in Hebrews is because through Christ we have a great high priest that can actually forgive. But not only that, it's not a temporary high priest. It is a high priest that will continue on. As long as we try and draw near to God, He will continue to be interceding for each and every one of us. Any questions or comments so far? Okay. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, I'm going to break this down. We see five qualities of Melchizedek's priesthood. It is a priesthood of righteousness, a priesthood of peace. He is royalty, Melchizedek being a king, and a personal priesthood rather than an inherited priesthood. What's the difference between a personal priesthood and an inherited priesthood? What's that? Okay, if you are from the tribe of Levi and you are a man, guess what? Priest. You inherited that right there. But if you do it by... If you are a personal priesthood, that means you had no heritage to, to make you worthy of being a priest. It was either divinely appointed or divinely appointed. Uh, if he would have chosen it for himself, he could not have been sacrificing and blessing if he was just like, you know what, I think today I'm going to be a most high priest and a king. Didn't work like that. God had to anoint him because he was the one that gave those conditions in the first place. In the Old Testament, however, the throne and the altar were separated. King Isaiah, as we read about, wanted to make sacrifices and instead broke out in leprosy. 
It could be that Melchizedek is not uh, the, the Son of God. It could be that Melchizedek uh, was an angel. could have been that he was someone uh, that's not from this earth. Not going to say aliens. It's not. There's, some people do speculate that, but we're not going to get into that. Uh, I don't believe that that is the case. Uh, it could be, however, and these are the two options that it came down for me. And again, I studied this for a long, 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 long time uh, and just recently kind of made up my mind. I believe that it is either the Son of God or it is, as some people claim, a real man uh, that was a real king and a real priest of a certain people. It just doesn't fit together. Whenever we read Scripture and the descriptions given, it's not figurative. It is literally someone that had no beginning and end and no genealogy. Any questions or comments? By God. That's exactly right. And that's that's why I wanted to focus on that phrase according to the order, because it's in like manner, in the same way. And we go on to look at the description given of Jesus, and it's the same as Melchizedek. And so either Abraham uh, was looking at another man and for some reason saw this man as someone worthy of getting 10% of all the spoils in battle, or he saw Melchizedek for who he really was, and that is the Son of God, just pre-incarnate. Uh, and that, that's really what makes sense in my mind, because for Abraham, who just defeated all of these kings, uh, he doesn't he wouldn't just give his money to a random man that claimed to be a king because he or a priest because there was no Levitical priesthood. There was no command to give 10%. Abraham did this after Melchizedek blessed him. And so it's very interesting to see just how uh, this plays out between Abraham and Melchizedek. It doesn't seem like Abraham's talking to another man. It seems like he got a blessing from the Son of God and then he gave a tenth to the Son of God. Uh, but that is my humble opinion, and um, that's what I have to say. He he goes beyond the the typical type and anti type that you see in scripture. Uh, for example, if you had a and if you had, let's say, the tabernacle is considered uh, a type and anti type of the church today. You have the the most holy of holies, where we can now, as priests ourselves, approach the throne of God and make those offerings on our own. There's a lot of type and anti type there, but when it comes to Melchizedek and Jesus, there's a lot of uh, specific details given about Melchizedek that you can't just say, "Oh, okay, yeah, he didn't have a mom or dad." That happens a lot. Doesn't usually happen that often. Do uh, you have something to say, Postway? Yeah, I was thinking and looking into the, the Jewish religion, what the Jews think about, because it didn't come from, from the Torah, but that's something they, they study a lot. And Jesus probably heard a lot of what they uh, He don't talk a lot, because again, that's not necessary to be mentioned in the, in the gospel. But uh, apparently, it said that some of the traditions that the Mm. Some of the traditions of the Jews talk about that Sam is incarnated and is from uh, become a um, Melchizedek. And another, another, <laughs> another mm. uh, tradition said uh, it was an angel. That was Jewish. Uh, there was a Jewish rabbi in the year 100, give or take, before Jesus that started that, that he was a son because in the lineage, and you know, we come through to say it, or the anyway. Uh, Abraham and Seth lived at the same time. That's hard to imagine. But, you know, Abraham didn't live that old. But Seth, there was only eight people that, that lived before mm -hmm. and after the flood. And 
it, it's in the Jewish Talmud, or it's a Jewish rabbi started that teaching. I don't know where it comes from. I don't see. I don't see how you can. Well, and, and you'll notice, so what happens uh, whenever I'm studying for stuff is I'll look, at, um, I'll look at writings at the time and the beliefs of the early church as well as the Jews. Um, I don't always base everything on those just because uh, one of the inter- intertestamental writings, the Book of Enoch, uh, claims that there were giants, but that they were over 5,000 feet tall. Uh, and so... It's not like you can just open it up and read it at face value and say, you know what, that's crazy, a mile tall. I don't think we've seen a a femur that's, you know, as tall as the Empire State Building. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to, yeah, go ahead. Well, one would say that it's Sam, another one would say that it's an angel. And uh, scholars have argued that that was a dream for me. So, I can understand that Jenny Jew is talking about that dream. Yep. Well, and, and you got to think about who Melchizedek appeared to in the significance of it. It's Abraham, the person that eventually the great high priest that will reign forever is going to come through. And so you have Melchizedek coming to Abraham, knowing that down the line he was going to be that exact replica of who appeared to Abraham at the beginning of this promise. And so you're keeping the time frame in mind, and you're also seeing the significance of that visit and the fact that he offered bread and wine in Genesis 14, verse 18, and then Luke 22, Jesus offers bread and wine. It's going, okay, do we have the same person here that's just appearing the pre-incarnate before flesh and then afterwards? And to me, that's what makes sense. Any other questions or comments before we close? And that's uh, the question for tonight. Yes, because Melchizedek is the same thing as saying Jesus. Uh, But that would be my own opinion. I could be wrong, uh, and everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But based on Scripture, um, it does appear to be that Melchizedek uh, was just Jesus revealing himself to the Father of the, the lineage that he would come from later on down the road. Yep. Yep. And that's a whole that's a whole nother part of it that we could have gotten into if we had the time for tonight. But that's another one that we were going to look at was the fact that Abraham, uh, Jesus claimed to be among Abraham at, at a point in his life, which is a crazy study in and of itself. Yes. I was just going to say something so sorry. Well, let's end the class with it. Well, I was going to ask, you know, so you're, you're telling us that it wasn't just sheer coincidence that they just happened to the past. It's not. Time. It's weird, you know? <laughs> and, and basically, I could have summed this whole class up by saying, go read Genesis 14, Psalm 110, and Hebrews 5 through 7, and Melchizedek is Jesus. Thank you. Good night.